of joining. As you will notice, this meeting is being recorded. Um, we will be able to follow up to send you this. You can watch it on demand or should you know anybody else that cannot attend. You will see that there is a Q&A box below the slides. Please do put your questions into there. Um, we will be reading out the questions anonymously, so don't worry about having your name for your reassurance. We will also be following up any questions should we run out of time. If you are having any IT problems or issues, please press the raise hand button and I'll be able to assist you. Um, but for now, I will pass you over to Philip who will get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our CEE and EMEA Roots to Recovery webinar. On behalf of Colt, uh, Warsaw Stock Exchange and S&P Global Rating, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this event. My name is Philip Dushik. I am the Deputy Director of Market Development and Head of Product Sales for the Warsaw Stock Exchange. On this welcome address, I have uh, Arthur Rank, Head of uh, Capital Markets for Europe and US for Colt Technology. Followed by our, uh, following our welcome address will be Sylvain Breuer, who is the Chief EMEA Economist for S&P Global Ratings. And he'll be presenting the current views on the European economy uh, during this uh, COVID-19 landscape. Uh, following, uh, following that presentation, we have an all-star cast uh, in, an, in a super informative discussion panel. Uh, this will be led by Mr. Marek Dietl, who is the president of the management board of the Warsaw Stock Exchange, as well as the economic advisor to the president of Poland. Joining him will be Marcin Petrakowski, who is the region head for uh, EMEA, for S&P Global Ratings, as well as Ashwin Sharma, who is the lead SEMIA and Global Emerging Market Sales for Goldman Sachs. And finishing up is Terence Chabe, who is the Capital Markets Business Development Manager for Colt. Now, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the Warsaw Stock Exchange to those of you who had not had the chance to uh, look into our markets. We are by far the largest and most liquid exchange in the region. Some, of, uh, some investors even refer to us as the gateway to the Central and Eastern European region. Next slide, please. As you can see, we are a full service exchange providing listing services as well as secondary market trading in equities, derivatives, bonds, as well as commodities as we are, part, as we are an owner of the Polish Power Exchange. This is supplemented by post-trade uh, post-trade services, as well as a full suite of market data solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, market access is pretty standard uh, relative to other exchanges, uh, either through direct membership or direct electronic access through one of our uh, local or foreign members, which you see here listed on the right-hand side. We also provide co-location services for those interested, and connectivity can be uh, either directly via one of our telco providers, such as Colt, or through an external uh, administrator. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just an idea what, uh, what the market share looks like uh, on our markets. Uh, in the left-hand side, you can see a, a graph, a pretty standard 12% investors, uh, individual investors, uh, and the rest uh, making up institutional investments from foreign and local, uh, and local uh, institutional clients. Our new connect market, which is our sort of uh, uh, SME, uh, growth market, and it's mostly uh, it's mostly retail investors. Our derivatives uh, segment is fairly uh, fairly evenly sp split up between individual investors and uh, and institutional investors, where 47% of the flow goes to individual investors. Uh, following slide, uh, Warsaw among its peers. This is a very interesting uh, interesting table. Um, as you can see, this is a, these numbers are the year-on-year the -year turnover growth for uh, all the exchanges in the region. As you can see, end of February and March uh, were fairly dynamic and volatile, uh, volatile periods of time. And therefore, year-on-year uh, uh, -year turnover growth was fairly, uh, fairly, fairly large in most exchanges. Uh, although we did not get a triple-digit number, we were at 57% in March. What you can see is uh, April and May, we were able to keep that trend uh, of year-on-year uh, -year, uh, turnover growth. And the final slide uh, shows you a little bit uh, of the details in terms of the uh, turnover growth, both the cash market and the derivatives market. So here on the left-hand side, you can see that our cash market in June of 2020 
uh, is still 65, 65% year-on-year growth. Um, and our new connects are uh, our uh, SME uh, growth market grew over a thousand percent year on year. What's driving these? Uh, what's driving these uh, turnover growths? Well, it's we think mostly not mostly, but a big part of that is the uh, the retail investor. Uh, in March and April of, uh, of this year, the Polish brokers recorded an, uh, a record breaking increase in new accounts, over forty seven seven thousand new investment accounts, and also uh, we have. As of last year, the Polish uh, pension system was revamped uh, uh, and restructured to closely resemble the UK's state pension and US's 401k system where additional flow is mandated to go to the exchange. Uh, and this will be the end for me. Uh, the following slide is just some contact information. Should you have any questions regarding uh, any of the slides or market access or connectivity, please definitely feel free to contact either myself or uh, Peter uh, who will be uh, who will be moderating the discussion panel. Um, thanks very much again. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. And please, uh, Arthur, uh, off to you. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arthur Rank. I head up our Capital Markets Solutions team, um, which covers um, uh, specialist sales across Europe and the US to support the Colt Capital Markets uh, account teams across the region. And it gives me great pleasure on behalf of Colt to welcome everybody um, to the webinar this afternoon. Uh, thanks to our panel panelists and uh, speakers for joining us and also to all our participants for taking the time today to uh, to join us on the, on the webinar. Um, when we began our partner discussions with um, the Warsaw Stock Exchange, it couldn't have come at a better time as Colt was um, investing heavily in expanding our network globally. Um, and a key part of that expansion was uh, extending our um, IQ network into uh, further into Central and into uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe. Um, so we had a, a large build out uh, project in 2019, which extended the Colt IQ network into eight new countries and into 10 new cities, bringing them online and providing bandwidth services of up to 100 gigs to those locations and into key data centers within those cities. It allowed us to launch our optical services, which includes the wave and spectrum products and IP services in the, within the region, in addition to the previously provided Ethernet services. Uh, next slide, please, Michaela. So now within region, within the CE region, um, the IQ network um, fully supports a range of services, including unprotected services, protected, full, full uh, circuit diversity, and also customer defined routing. So we're better serving the, the markets within Central and Eastern Europe better than ever as a result of our expansion. Uh, next slide, please, Michaela. So in terms of uh, just to introduce you to what my team covers in, in particular, away from our, our standard uh, network and voice services at Colt, we, we focus on our capital markets trading and data um, uh, specialist products. Uh, so this, is, this, this includes five main um, uh, elements, our dedicated connectivity, where we can build out a dedicated um, extranet um, to connect a broker to their customers or an exchange to uh, their members, um, such as we provide for the London Metal Exchange on their LME net platform today. Uh, PrismNet is our global financial extranet and underpins the, um, our capital markets ecosystem. So we connect customers and providers across North America, the, uh, Europe and Asia to our financial ecosystem and that underpins all our, our data and execution traffic uh, for our capital markets community. Our ULL services are focused on the uh, customers who want bleeding edge and lowest latencies possible. You know, those, those companies who are looking for, for the fastest possible latencies in the market to execute arbit arbitrage trading between two locations, for example. In terms of hosting, we provide hosting services um, in co-location and proximity facilities across the US, uh, Europe and um, Asia. We uh, are in over 30, uh, 30 venues. This includes uh, locations such as the CME, London Stock Exchange, uh, Equinix data centers worldwide, um, and also the likes of Hong Kong Exchange, Singapore Exchange and JPX. And finally, market data. Um, within our ecosystem, um, we, we connect to uh, over 50 exchanges globally and uh, provide a, a mix of um, both raw and normalized feeds uh, without accessing those, those markets. Um, so that data under is, is also transported via the prison net 
financial extranet and also within our co-location hosting facilities uh, depending on a customer's need. Um, my team is mirrored by a team in, in, um, in Asia Pacific who supports the teams out there. So we, we have a dedicated team of experts focused on ele low latency electronic trading in the capital markets ecosystem to support the needs of our customers globally. Um, that's underpinned also by um, a dedicated capital markets help desk and support organization, 24 by 7 support, um, defined ser service managers for specific customer needs, and continuing investment in uh, expanding our portfolio. Uh, next slide, please, Michaela. So here I just wanted to indicate, you, show you today where um, the, the core backbone of uh, Prism that sits globally today. Um, the locations in red show you where we have Prism Net Pops and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, provide hosting facilities. And those in amber show where we are planning on expanding uh, in the near future. So we have clear roadmap, plan, roadmap plans to expand the Prism Net backbone um, across the globe. Uh, one, uh, next slide, please. And you know, I, I touched on the um, uh, uh, on kind of the expansion side of Colt. Um, we're very, very proud to to be partnered with um, the Warsaw Stock Exchange and to um, offer connectivity into Warsaw today via PrismNet. We already have customers connected and are growing that number. Um, but also, we're continuing to invest and expand our our, our exchange offering uh, across PrismNet. So here are just some of the um, exchange exchanges specifically within kind of exchange within the emerging market and central market markets uh, that we'll be adding to the uh, platform and ecosystem uh, this year. So that was it from me as a way of introduction. Thank you all again for attending and uh, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Sylvain Breuer from S&P. Thank you very much Arthur, thank you very much Philippe uh, for having me. It's a great pleasure to, to speak today uh, and good afternoon to, to everyone. Let's have a look on the, on the European economy, uh, maybe a bit more the Western economy uh, of Europe. But um, uh, if we can, and maybe starting with the, yeah, exactly with this chart uh, and some good news. Some good news um, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, you can see here that the, uh, the, the curve of uh, COVID-19 in terms of new infections has flattened a lot uh, in Europe, uh, in the uh, main five uh, more, most populated uh, countries of Europe, so the, uh, 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 Germany, the UK, France, Italy, and Spain. Altogether, no more report more than 2,000 new cases of COVID-19 a day. That's a tenth only of the peak of the pandemic uh, we had at the beginning of April. Good news in Europe, but no all clear from the uh, from the pandemic. If you consider that uh, other big countries in the world do not uh, share the, the the luck uh, we have here uh, in Europe, uh, look at the uh, light blue line showing you uh, the the situation in the, U in the United States of America. Uh, where we have more than uh, 50,000 new cases a day. And we can even not say this is the second wave starting in America. Some, the, the, the first wave did not, um, uh, did not uh, uh, stop so far. So, uh, and also big, uh, Europe, big uh, emerging countries are in, uh, uh, in the same situation, considering, for instance, Brazil, uh, also India. Uh, as regards the situation of the virus uh, curve in uh, Eastern and Central Europe, mm. uh, the situation is, uh, is is a bit between the between uh, Europe and the US. So, if, for instance, in in Poland, the, the the virus curve has reached a plateau, uh, 300 new cases a day uh, since uh, since mid April, uh, no change. But uh, at least there is some hope. Uh, the active case, the number of active cases in, in Poland is, is going a bit down. So, um, and also the situation in, in Turkey uh, is uh, looking a bit uh, a bit better than than uh, than two weeks ago. Um, so, some good news. No all clear. There is a risk of facing a second wave uh, at fall, but so far, uh, so far, good news uh, from the pandemic uh, in Europe. And um, this allows, as we can see on the next slide, please, the flattening of the curve uh, allowed uh, uh, many European governments to ease social distancing measures. So if you take, for instance, the 
uh, the stringency index developed by the Oxford University to uh, to, to measure the, uh, uh, the, the 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 strength of the lockdowns. Uh, then you see uh, here that we have uh, 15 to 20 points uh, easing in, uh, in in lockdown since uh, since uh, uh, end of April, and um, mechanically this easing in social distancing measures allow the economies to restart, as we can see on the next slide, um, showing you, for instance, mobility data, so high frequency data. You know that economies had to turn to data scientists uh, looking at uh, the most experimental data uh, to assess the, uh, the pace of the recession and, uh, uh, and the exit from the recession. Here you see the traffic congestion uh, on, uh, on the roads of, uh, of uh, five uh, uh, big European metropolitan areas, um, telling you that uh, activity traffic has almost uh, resumed to normal, not totally. Uh, other high frequency uh, and experimental uh, data um, show the same picture, and especially, uh, interesting, uh, interestingly, um, uh, credit card transaction data uh, in, uh, in many European countries suggest, uh, for instance, in Spain, in, in, in France, uh, in Germany, that consumer spending at the end of June has almost normalized. And this is great news. It shows that the, uh, the economy uh, is, uh, is normalizing um, quickly, maybe more quickly than many believed. Uh, and this is good, but however, this is a short-term recovery. And um, after this uh, kind of V-shape reco recovery that has been, uh, that has been uh, 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 forecasted, uh, uh, if, I, I, if I may say, by, uh, by the rebound in equity markets some months ago, uh, the main question, as we can see on the next slide, the main question will be uh, that of long-term growth. And um, you see the, the, the road to recovery uh, we expect uh, for uh, the European economies, both the Eurozone and the UK, but it's more or less the same for each big region, uh, economic regions of this world. Um, after this, uh, this kind of V-shaped recovery that will last uh, over the next uh, two to three quarters, we expect a flattening of, uh, of growth so that um, it is unlikely that we will get back to the pre-COVID 2019 GDP level mm -hmm. in Europe uh, before, uh, before, let's say, mid-2022. Uh, and we will still after uh, 20, at the end of 2023, we will, um, we will have uh, some losses compared to, uh, to what we would have uh, add without this pandemic, uh, losses, permanent losses in terms of economic activity over the medium term, uh, between three to 5% uh, in the main uh, European uh, economies. Uh, so this, you see this the, over the long term, if we have a, on the short term, if we have a V-shaped recovery, over the longer term, we have more to, to so we believe in a, some kind of tick-shaped uh, recovery, as you can, uh, as you can see. Um, turning, uh, having said that, and turning to financial markets, uh, this crisis is like no others. Um, you see here on this uh, on this chart showing you the the level of, uh, of 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 fragmentation on financial markets on European financial markets. Uh, this crisis is less severe than uh, the great financial crisis in uh, 20 years ago now, and the European debt crisis um, at, in 2011. Uh, 2011. Uh, so this, um, for, for if, if you have some, uh, some, some, if you want some more detail on this uh, composite indicator, um, it is uh, uh, computed as, uh, as uh, correlations, uh, volatility among asset classes and cross correlation among asset, uh, among, uh, asset classes in euro. So less fragmentation, I would say we, we, we have had fragmentation uh, during this crisis, but the most of fragmentation we had uh, was on, um, on social life and the free travel area in Europe, not on the European financial crisis. Not sorry, not on European financial markets. And these good results, um, uh, uh, market fragmentations, has been contained 
thanks, as we can say on the, see on the next, uh, on the next slide, um, thanks to a prompt and, and, and coordinated policy response at uh, each uh, level. In, um, in, in, in two aspects, I think we can speak about a policy revolution to deal with this crisis. First, uh, we had a swift and forceful fiscal and monetary response. Look at these figures. So government states in, uh, in the Eurozone um, uh, delivered a 25 percentage point of GDP fiscal response to this crisis. Most of that in forms of 90% of that in forms of loans and guarantees and equity injection for sure, but a 25 percentage point of GDP response. The, the, the monetary authority, the, the, the ECB, delivered uh, so far a 15 percentage point of GDP response. Um, and this is so swift and forceful uh, 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 policy response. Think that in the, during the great financial crisis or after the great financial crisis, um, it took the ECB seven years and one and two recessions to embark on QE, seven years. Now, after only three months of crisis, the ECB balance sheet has been expanded by 1.5 trillion of euro. So impressive. Uh, and of course, uh, and no, sorry, before, before I, I pass to the next point, the second aspect of uh, this uh, uh, policy revolution is uh, what you have, the, 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 the bar you have in the middle uh, of this chart. Uh, the policy response uh, has also been addressed at the level of the European Union. And with uh, its uh, three layer safety net uh, to address uh, risks on SME, on government uh, uh, um, and health, uh, the plus uh, the EU recovery plan currently under discussion, the European Union um, uh, delivered a nine percentage point of GDP fiscal response to the economy. We, the, uh, how this money uh, will be uh, will be allocated uh, remains uh, to be uh, to be decided so far. But that's that's a real novelty also that the European Union uh, helped member states uh, to uh, uh, cushion economic uh, shocks and asymmetric shocks. Uh, this, this is something really important to, to bear in mind and that helped avoiding more fragmentation uh, on, on the European financial markets. Um, to give you one example how this uh, coordinated policy response worked, um, we can have a look on the next slide. Uh, we have had during the month of April and May uh, almost 800 billion of uh, government debt issuance in the Eurozone, twice as much as normally. And in terms of net issuance, it was something like 350 billion. The ECB, through uh, with uh, the uh, res uh, uh, um, stepping up its QE programs, the ECB absorbed uh, two thirds of the net issuance of Eurozone, uh, of Eurozone governments during these two months. Um, this is even more than what the Fed did. The Fed uh, uh, purchased directly 60% um, of the net issuance of the U.S. Treasuries during the uh, during the, 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 the months of March and April. So you see very strong coordinated um, uh, response from both policy, from both fiscal and monetary uh, authorities uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. The result is that we have had, uh, so far no sharp increase in interest rates. And if you look at uh, interest rates today on uh, European government debts, they are now back at what where they were uh, at the end of last year. So uh, despite a uh, uh, 15 point of GDP increase in, in, in government uh, debt. So uh, impressive results from the, from the uh, policy uh, side. Um, what was the aim of this policy response, um, especially on the uh, fiscal side? The monetary side is clear. It was just to, 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 to uh, give uh, uh, time and, 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 uh, and um, uh, room of maneuver for, for, for the fiscal authorities to bolster the economy. But um, the aim of the fiscal response, if we can look at the next slide, was to keep the human capital afloat, uh, you see here uh, on uh, this uh, chart that in, the, in Europe, 
it's not only the eurozone but um, if you look at other uh, other uh, countries uh, uh, of Europe uh, the unemployment rate barely increased since uh, since uh, the outbreak of the crisis the counterpart is that uh, more than a quarter of the European labor force is on short-term working schemes. So the European governments decided to subsidize massively uh, the labor markets, unlike the US government, which uh, preferred uh, to have a market clearing uh, uh, of, the, of that crisis, and the unemployment rate jumped to above uh, uh, 14 percent uh, in March in the US. Now it's, uh, it's going down, it will probably go down further, but we haven't that, uh, that case in Europe. Uh, this is a policy choice. Uh, both uh, both uh, a solution offers uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of the US um, solution uh, to, uh, uh, for market clearing of the crisis is that the recovery might be uh, stronger than in Europe. Um, the advantages of the European uh, policy response um, uh, is that uh, we keep the human capital afloat and companies do not need to rehire the people they fired uh, just uh, two months ago. Um, so that's and, and the short term working schemes uh, were of, of great benefit to the European economy uh, during the great financial crisis, the first time they were, uh, they were tried as a policy tool. The second part of the fiscal policy response was to keep the working capital afloat also, as we can see on the next slide. Uh, thanks to uh, huge state-backed guarantees of bank loans uh, to non-financial corporations, uh, and especially SMEs, uh, we have avoided a liquidity squeeze during this crisis, despite a, a, a complete uh, drying up of cash, cash flows for many companies. Look at this chart, the, 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 the light blue line uh, shows you the, uh, the increase in bank loans to non-financial corporations. It has uh, never been as much. We have had uh, since March more than 250 billion euros of uh, loans, bank loans uh, to uh, non-financial corporations. It's twice more than um, the uh, total uh, amount of new loans uh, in 12 months uh, in the past in the past 12 months so impressive um, credit impulse uh, avoiding uh, avoiding uh, um, uh, a liquidity uh, a liquidity crunch uh, at time of, uh, of 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 the lockdowns um, so you see uh, the the mechanic of the policy response uh, was extremely good extremely well designed and thought however however it's not enough it's not enough uh, we can um, uh, and maybe we can see the next slide um, keeping the human capital and the working capital afloat uh, is a necessary condition but not sufficient condition to make sure that the european recovery will be uh, not short lived um, we need, Europe needs, uh, needs to invest a lot of money. Uh, we know uh, that you can see here uh, on, this, on this chart that uh, public investment in the past decade has been much too low in all European countries. Maybe one exception is the UK, uh, but also the UK has its problems in terms of public investment. But in, in, Euro in continental Europe, public investment is much too low. Um, because of the of the rules, because of the high level of debt, uh, but because also of, of policy choices, and um, the result is that now Europe um, has an investment gap to fill, uh, especially in terms of infrastructure, green assets. Um, to fill the gap, the IMF ex uh, um, estimates that Europe would need three percentage points of GDP investment, public investment a year, uh, a year. So the EU recovery plan that is under discussion with the 750 billion euros uh, plans and a bit less as we got the, 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 the recovery plan stricto sensu, it's more 560 billions. Um, this is a good thing, but it's not enough. Uh, so it can be seen as initial ignition for a more investment in Europe, especially if you consider that the European money might be leveraged uh, uh, by private money, 
uh, through the different uh, European funds, but we need much more uh, investment um, to, uh, to make sure uh, that uh, the European recovery uh, or the European economy exits the trap of low trend growth that the, 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 this trap we have fallen in uh, in, the past, uh, in the past decade. And um, to finish on, uh, on, 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 on looking forward, uh, on the next slide, um, well, a lot of risks are surrounding the European recovery right now. The first, uh, the first risk is for sure um, uh, to face a second wave of the virus and uh, with the uh, crucial questions as regard of forecast on uh, whether uh, European uh, governments will impose the same kind of lockdowns uh, to their population and the economy in case of, of a second wave. Uh, if, if they impose the same kind of lockdowns, then we will have no uh, tick-shaped recovery, but probably some, something like a W uh, recovery. Um, we have uh, also the risk of the policy support uh, being uh, withdrawn uh, too, too, too early. And it Um, central bank money can be extended quite indefinitely. Uh, the Bank of Japan showed that, but tax money cannot be uh, extended indefinitely, and the markets will, will, will tell uh, where is the limit. Um, but we have also a resurgence of political risks uh, in Europe with the Brexit, uh, the risk of uh, 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 seeing a no deal at the end of, of the year is real. I would say it's now it's, uh, to have, it's, um, uh, uh, it's something like 50-50% 50, 50, uh, chance to have a deal or, or no deal. And if we have a deal, it would be a, a minimum deal, a Canada-style deal. Um, and, uh, and the external environment, and especially the situation in, emerging, in big emerging countries, uh, um, is, uh, is another risk uh, bearing on the, on the European economy. Uh, finally, uh, the, my last Last slide showing you our current forecasts. Uh, you see uh, where uh, what we uh, what uh, we uh, expect. We are a bit less pessimistic than the IMF or the OECD. Uh, a bit less optimistic than uh, the uh, European Commission in terms of uh, recession uh, for this year. Uh, and maybe one point uh, I didn't touch. We do not expect uh, inflation uh, to resume or, or to bounce back despite the strong uh, the, 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 the strong increase in, in, in money. Uh, yeah, and I think I, uh, I'm done with, uh, with my presentation. Uh, back the, the, after the panel. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Peter Nikovic, and as you can tell, I am the uh, London representative of the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Uh, Philip earlier introduced the panelists, so I won't necessarily go through and introduce uh, everybody one by one. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get to the, 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 the panel main and some, some questions that uh, I've prepared. Uh, the panel today will be recorded, so if anybody wants to watch this or send a link to their clients, uh, please feel free. But also in terms of the Q&A, so uh, I will leave some time at the end for some Q&A. Uh, but I would say that if you've got any questions that are particularly relevant to any of the answers that the panellists are going through, I can happily read them out. All the questions will be anonymised. Uh, I will be controlling uh, the question, but if there are any questions that, that have been asked which don't end up being answered by the panelists during the panel, I or Philip or whoever the relevant person uh, can follow up after today's, uh, today's session. So, okay, um, panelists welcome, most of all welcome to the audience. I, can, I know that we had a, a, quite a few registrations and I can see nearly 90 participants uh, who have signed up. 
19 participants who can who have signed up. Um, we face a little bit of an impossible task uh, today because I can again when I go through the participant list I can see that there's a mixed audience of very international people, local people based in Poland, there are algo traders, there are quant funds, uh, there is the traditional long only buy side all participating in this in this webinar. Um, at the same time, we've got CE Polish experts, as well as people who, are, who seem to be new to the region. Um, there is a Confucian saying, uh, which I just bear with me as I go through this. So everything has beauty, but not everyone can see it. Well, I'm going to rewrite it for this webinar panel. Uh, and the, the hypothesis is that CE Poland was before COVID and still is and will be a beautiful opportunity for investment, whether that's short, medium or long term, but not everyone has seen it. So our objective, so our objective is to help traders, whether it, whether it be the automated day, um, day traders, point and click or you can see us signed up, or the institutional guys uh, see the opportunity and with help, and with the help of Colt, access the CE Polish markets. By way of transitioning from Sylvain's presentation about the Eurozone mostly, I think the first question I'd like to, to launch is really at you, Marcin, from the CEE perspective, from the Samir perspective, but also I thought I could ask Marek to maybe come in, uh, particularly with his um, role as an economic advisor to the president. Uh, could you, could you, um, could you, Marcin, maybe give us an introduction of where were the po where were the CE economies, and in particular the Polish economy, prior to the pandemic? So we just set the scene for the audience. How, where were we at? How were the economies performing? How how well was Poland doing? Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Um, hello, everyone. So, well, to set the, you know, in a way, setting the background. So, of course, Central Eastern Europe was an area of, uh, you know, relative growth comparing to, to, to peers in Western Europe and, and, and I would say globally. We definitely saw that, you know, in particular, tier one countries from, from Central Eastern Europe, Poland was one of them. Hungary, Czech Republic were definitely recording, you know, relatively stable growth, were expanding their economies, were improving um, labor markets, were improving, um, I would say, retained capital and overall performance of the economies. So it goes without saying, and Poland in particular, that, you know, Poland has entered the crisis in a relatively healthy state, which has created some kind of a caution which uh, continues and will continue to effectively, you know, allow Poland to weather through the storm, despite the fact that, you know, we need to recognize the fact that recession uh, will take place, is happening, and it is a fact, uh, which goes back to what Sylvain was mentioning. The recession in 2020 and the weight on, on public finances as a result of the pandemic is definitely evident. Uh, the Polish economy will contract for the first time since, what is it, 92? Um, and there's, you know, the, the expectation for this goes anywhere between 4 and 3% of contraction. Uh, actually, today, the EU has published the data where they're talking about, I'm just checking it, they're talking about 4.6% contraction. We are more in the, in the, we are currently, our estimates are at around 4%. So, uh, you know, we need to recognize that fact. But as I said, there is, a, a caution was built. The economies of this part of the world, and again, Poland is a good example, remain diversified. They remain competitive. Um, Poland, in particular, external public leverage is relatively low. Uh, there's monetary f flexibility. Uh, there, was a, there, there has been a policy stimulus implemented, which also Sylvain, Sylvain mentioned European figures, global figures in Poland and in other parts of Central Eastern Europe. Governments have lived up to the expectation. In Poland, the, pol the policy stimulus is around 10% of GDP. Uh, you know, again, helping to mitigate the shock. So, you know, let's not expect a miracle. Uh, this part of the world will go through a, a tough time, will go through a turmoil, will go through a downturn. The base is relative, the, ba the base was solid, but still we need to expect that this, that this year will be a year of, of, of downturn, though paving the way for a recovery. And that recovery will not be only a, re a regional recovery, but as Sylvain mentioned, our expectations are that overall economies, global economies, in particular the Eurozone, will start to recover around the first, the third to the fourth quarter of this year, building up momentum for relatively healthy growth levels next year. 
Thank you, Martin. I don't, I don't know if any, if Marek, you wanted to, to come in around that. Uh, thank you very, very much, Peter. Uh, thank you, uh, Sylvan and uh, Martin, for the nice introduction. In between, I had to change the device because it's one good freezing. But I would like to jump in uh, quickly to the topic. Uh, so, for, for, first of all, uh, what is uh, what Polish government is doing is something what we have never seen before. Uh, we have uh, we didn't have any QE uh, in the past. Uh, we did, we are not hit hard by the uh, by the financial crisis of 2008. So, actually, in the last 30 years, we have no single year of uh, uh, GDP contraction. This year might be the first uh, uh, in this 30-year uh, period, uh, but uh, the question is when we uh, can expect a recovery. Well, uh, Polish government together with the Polish uh, Central Bank and the Polish Development Fund uh, built up a recovery plan for around 12% uh, of GDP. Uh, which is partially uh, funded uh, by uh, quantitative easing and partially by the taxpayers' money. Uh, so combined with a relatively short period of lockdown, the Polish economy, uh, we can expect that in the first um, uh, quarter of uh, um, 2021 or in the second quarter, of the next, next year, we will reach the same level of GDP as we had uh, at the, by the end of 2019. So compared to the um, forecast by Sylvan uh, related to the uh, Western European countries when the contraction in the GDP is sometimes double digit, Poland uh, seems to be quite resilient to the current crisis. Marcin, would you agree with, uh, with, with Marek's description? Well, I think where, you know where the economy is at. Well, I think you know uh, from from what our analytical team has published. I think yeah, we we definitely remain in the same of the same view. The resiliency is 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 visible, and I did talk about it in terms of the recovery. Definitely, the recovery, the expectation for the recovery is is here. Um, I mentioned the reasons for it, and indeed the the, the stimulus will further contribute. Uh, based on the latest, uh, be aware just for everyone's background, Poland is currently rated A minus. Our analytical uh, team has uh, confirmed that rating in mid of April this year, uh, effectively already seeing the first impact of COVID. So that was already referred to by the analytical team in that confirmation. And, and in that report, that the same statement appears in line with what Marek mentioned is that the strong buffers, you know, in tandem with the ongoing policy stimulus should uh, allow the Polish economy to recover by close between four and 5% next year, indeed bringing it roughly to its original pre-COVID-19 uh, path. So I think, you know, we are relatively at the same page and observing how things are developing now as the year kicks in and we're seeing first evidence that indeed consumer spending is recovering, entrepreneurial activity is, is getting back. And I think, you know, from a business perspective, what is important to note, and, I'm, and, I, and I hope we'll dedicate a bit more time later during the session, is, you know, the opportunities that this creates for entrepreneurs, for businesses, for certain industries in, in this part of the world. Like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to, uh, uh, to, to top up on that uh, recent tender for the government bonds, uh, euro bonds for Polish government. Uh, actually, the nominal rate is negative, so it shows that we can, uh, as a country, borrow at the negative uh, rate in the euro market. So it shows that the investors really trust uh, in the Polish economy. And still, we are uh, quite far from the uh, constitutional limit of the public debt of 60% GDP. So when you compare to the other countries, when you have uh, uh, often around 100% of GDP uh, public debt, we are still on the uh, safe side. Uh, and still, the balance sheet of Polish National Bank is not that packed with the government bonds compared to the uh, ECB. Okay, thank you. I think it's probably a good opportunity to bring Ash into the conversation from Goldman Sachs. Ash, um, bringing it down to kind of a, a financial markets, equity markets perspective, what, what, what have you been seeing in terms of the overall inflows, outflows of, of emerging markets and then down, down to the SEMIA level? Thank you very much, Peter. And, and, and again, thanks very much.
much for having me. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and it's a great question. And the, the outflows across global emerging markets have been staggering really year to date. We've seen 20 weeks of consecutive outflows across EM equity funds. That's total 61 billion US and represents the third longest outflow streak since 2000. So putting this into perspective, I guess, the streak of outflows from April to September of 2019, uh, 21 weeks, uh, and that registered 40 billion in outflows. We had another period from October 2013 through to March 2014, that was 22 weeks, uh, and only 50 billion. Uh, and again, comping that 50 billion to the 61 that we've seen thus far uh, in the year. So accordingly, EM clearly has lagged the flow bid that we've been seeing globally. Uh, and on our estimates, we, uh, we'd look to uh, circa 130 billion uh, of flows back into EM to address this flow gap vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. EM clearly at this juncture looking very under Um Poland hasn't been immune, um, certainly versus broader EM trends. Uh, performance and flows impacted by the listed financials in the most part. Uh, we know actually domestic cyclicals have actually fared relatively well. It's similar to European and US banks, clearly Polish financials tend to outperform in periods of yield curve steepening. Um, our strategists note, uh, and actually this is a big theme that we've been penning a lot of research on, but EM banks have lagged this trend largely on asset quality concerns, I'd say government crowding out given fiscal policy, etc. Uh, but the picture for the Polish banks even more nuanced, arguably linked to concerns around taxation and consolidation. Um, but performance wise, Poland stacks up relatively well, certainly versus CE peers uh, from an equity perspective and is, is very much middle of the pack across global emerging markets. Uh, and I think an important point to note here, MSCI EM closed the second quarter up 17 and change percent uh, that's the best quarterly return since the second quarter of uh, 2009, uh, where EM registered a 33.5% return. Uh, and so clearly that's spanning some 45 quarters. That's quite impressive. Um, EM, subsequent to that 2009 move, uh, rallied 20% in the third quarter of 2009 uh, and an additional 8 0.25% in the fourth quarter of, of 2009 too. So plenty of reasons to be constructive here, Peter. Okay. I mean, Marcin and Marek talk about, uh, mentioned, I guess, Poland's recovery, uh, Poland pre-COVID, Poland maybe post-COVID. But what, what, is, what is overall the Goldman Sachs view of, of Poland? Um, taking a step back, if I may, as a house, um, and, and again, a subject that we've, we've been getting a, a lot of mind share on, we reference a narrowing growth dichotomy between Europe and the US at this juncture, um, i.e. we're looking for stronger growth in the Euro, Euro area vis-a-vis -vis the US, uh, and that's the case we feel on our numbers over the next two years. So just by way of example, we're looking for 8.8% growth in, in the Euro area for 2021, uh, 3.622, and that stacks up versus the 5.8 and the 3.2 respectively in 21, 22 that we have for the US. Um, across EM, we're, we broadly expect a V-shaped recovery in GDP. Uh, Poland is befitting of that trend. So we're looking for minus 5% growth this year, uh, but a punchy recovery uh, in 2021. Um, so our economists penciling in 6.3% for the year. And that looks quite favorable when you consider the broader 5.2 that we have for the Samir space as a whole. So, you know, our view very similar to what you've already heard from Marek um, at GPW, but also clearly from Sylvain and Marcin and our, and, and our colleagues at SMP. Uh, with regard to rates, we expect 10 basis points to mark the floor for rates in Poland. Uh, additional easings largely going to come in the QE space, so akin to comments that you've heard already. Interestingly, we are uh, clearly slightly more uh, dovish vis-a-vis -vis the street in that we pencil in the first rate hike uh, from the NBP only in 2022. So, uh, you know, taking that broader view, we're very constructive. There's a lot here. Uh, in fact, PLN is one of our conviction trades uh, across asset class within EM. In equities, uh, we tend to prefer PICAO um, uh, among the banks. We downgraded PKN this morning uh, on concerns around free cash flow, dividend, 
uh, and, and invariably our, our research tends to have a bias towards the consumer space. So we've got buyers in Dino and Eurocash. Uh, one thing that we would note is actually a, a pretty material tick up in retail participation. Uh, and that's been a theme that we've been seeing across other EMs too. Uh, Russia is, is another poster child of that theme, obviously. Uh, China uh, as well. Uh, and that's prompted a host of questions this week. Um, and, and that clearly befits the comments that we heard from, from Philip earlier in the webcast. Um, and another point I would make is that the ECM pipeline uh, looks relatively constructive in Poland too. So again, I think plenty of reasons to be excited at this juncture. Thanks, Ash. Uh, we well, had a question from the audience. Uh, the first question is around what are the potential impacts on CEE slash Poland uh, with regards to the, how do I put it, um, US-China relationship? Um, are there any potential impacts for the region or for Poland? So I, I'm going to hand it out to the three of you who wants to take it first. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not a secret that Poland is a very close uh, ally to the US. So uh, basically uh, the first uh, president or head of the state uh, uh, invited by uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, who was president of Poland, Andrzej Duda. So basically, those ties are very close. Uh, of course, geographically, uh, Poland is very well located uh, for a Belt and Road uh, initiative. So there are plenty of uh, infrastructure around that built in Poland. Uh, one of this is. Um, kind of integration of Polish infrastructure in the Solidarity Transportation Hub. So on the one hand, Poland is an inevitable part of the Belt and Road Initiative for China and in this infrastructure uh, project, uh, we are very keen on uh, working with uh, Chinese partners. But geopolitically, of course, Poland uh, belongs to the Western world and uh, our closest uh, ally is US and we should not forget that there are, there are a few um, uh, 1.3 million uh, Poles uh, living in the US and some of descendants of the Polish immigration, it ends up with a few million people uh, with some Polish roots in the US. So those ties uh, also on the private family levels uh, are also important in this uh, um, extreme good uh, US-Polish uh, relations. Marcin or, or, or Ash or and or Ash, any kind of views on, on what what um, US China relations means for for C and Poland? Well, my, my 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 comment on that would be more in respect to trading partners, Polish trading partners. You know, there's always a direct and indirect uh, impact. When we look at Germany and the impact that that uh, relationship, the potential deterioration of that relationship co causes, in particular on automotive, in particular on exports going out of the out of the eurozone, Germany in particular that naturally has an impact on Poland and Central Eastern Europe. So I would be mindful of that equation and, and note the wider picture, uh, more and more recognizing the fact that Poland standalone is you know, a well diversified and, 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 and competitive economy, but still being dependent and being part of, 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 of the value chain, which goes out from the Eurozone to both the US and China. So, so I think that's, that, that equation needs to, needs to remain top of mind for uh, market participants and investors. Ash, do you want to guess, jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, it's an unfortunate expression, so forgive me, but uh, I remember someone always sitting down with me when I started my career saying when China catches a cold, uh, the rest of EM tends to follow. Uh, and I say again, a rather unfortunate expression given what's going on at the moment, but, you know, I think putting aside the impact and, and, and as a house we've noted a marked deterioration in the chances of a trade re a resolution we um we, we, pr we produce a trade barometer it effectively extracts trade beta from several equity proxies to gauge kind of the intensity of market implied trade concern and that's moved from the highs of around 80 percent in mid-april to around 20 percent now so as a house we're not overly constructive that uh, we meet a, a meaningful resolution at this juncture um, but i would say putting that to the side and i think the moves in china that we've seen this week um, mm. certainly have, uh, have forced a number of incomings on our side um, mm. and the rally 
in Chinese A shares um, for a combination of factors, um, you know, robust economic opening, um, I think supportive macro policy and, and government rhetoric as well towards the equity market are all very befitting. And clearly, uh, if China were to move lower, as I say, it tends to take EM down with it, but the reverse is very often true as well. So when you add that to comments I made at the beginning with regard to the inflow picture or rather the lack thereof, the fact now we're, we're beginning to see some, some solid uh, participation and not only nuance to retail, but also institutional demand for Chinese domestic equity. I think that paints a, a pretty positive picture um, and it tends to be a very strong tailwind for the rest of the emerging market. With regard to, to Poland specifically, I mean, I think our view is broadly akin to, to what you heard from, from Marcin and indeed we think the bigger proxy on, on Poland is, is uh, what we're seeing across the ECB and, and the Eurozone only because that'd be a, a much bigger um, component of the uh, export picture. Okay. Um, I've got another question, Terence, this one's for you, or, or two questions. Uh, one, could you, from, from a Colts perspective, can you give an idea of the type of clients that are, um, without naming names, that are interested in access to Warsaw? That would be the first question. And, uh, and who do they need to contact if they want to access the Warsaw Stock Exchange? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Peter. And thanks for a very good, uh, interesting discussion. So uh, we've had a lot of demand for access to Warsaw. In fact, we started speaking to the Warsaw Stock Exchange in 2017. Uh, we decided to wait with the onboarding so we could actually expand our network, which allows us to be able to provide end-to-end -end visibility. So we had a pipeline of customers that was working with Philip and, and yourself trying to deliver those services within a reasonable period of time. And it, it, it's quite a varied uh, number of customers. I think there were some economic events and the growth of Poland as a region showed a lot of demand um, from market makers and systematic trading firms that were looking for low latency access into, into Poland, uh, as well as market data vendors. So a lot of market data vendors were looking for cost-effective and resilient access to, to the market in order to distribute those, um, the data to their customers, as well as a few key ISVs, um, sort of trading platforms that needed um, access. Um, and again, because we own the network and you know, we, we've talked a lot about resilience and, and, and obviously increased traffic and bandwidth due to market activity, um, our, 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 our decision to expand into that area uh, has been very good for us. I mean, even platforms like Zoom, you know, we underpin a lot of voice traffic we've seen um, you know, voice uh, traffic go up about 60% in the last few months, as well as data going up around 50%. So we're well sort of established to be able to provide connectivity. And uh, yeah, I mean, our contact details are, uh, are going to be made available. Uh, you know, feel free to contact myself or Arthur. Um, and we've also got our colleagues in, in, um, in Asia as well who can support. Great. Uh, there's a question here directly for Marek, if I can. Um, and it's around what, what was what was your what was your leadership team's approach to the COVID crisis? I mean, um, my understanding is that other markets made changes in terms of bans on this kind of trading or that kind of trading, whereas Warsaw kept fairly stable. Can I just get your your perspective, your view on on how you approached it as the exchange? Yeah. Uh, our approach was twofold. First of all, uh, pretty quickly we, we got uh, our operation um, to, uh, we dispersed our operation, 95% of our staff working uh, from uh, home. Uh, and the second was that uh, despite the crisis or because the crisis, actually there was a tremendous interest from the retail investors in Poland. We added up 60,000 retail accounts uh, in Poland, what was the highest growth in retail accounts uh, in the history. Uh, so uh, actually there was a willingness from our investors, both global and domestic, to keep on trading. So literally there was no any restrictions uh, on trading, um, no short selling bans, nothing like this. 
the only issue was that uh, some of our smaller members uh, found it difficult to uh, do the market making out of uh, their uh, home offices. So on some, some companies were left uh, with uh, less uh, market making uh, support, but uh, everything else worked very smoothly. Uh, and uh, we even uh, recorded uh, historically uh, highest number of um, of uh, transaction and different um, uh, different events on the exchange. So actually, trading was uh, smooth, uh, smooth, and, uh, and no uh, no any interruption in our uh, operation and uh, our both uh, trading infrastructure and uh, and uh, team uh, was uh, up to. Uh, speed with the demands from the investors for the active uh, trading. Uh, uh, once again, it shows also this entrepreneurial spirit of Poles when they saw the uh, opportunities when there was uh, really cheap on our exchange, they started to, uh, to buy out um, some of uh, our equities, especially in the tech and the biotechnology space. So now uh, our um, tech index is actually 75% uh, up from the, uh, from the January 2020. Uh, so those who were brave enough uh, to invest with us made uh, quite uh, decent returns. Thank you, Marek. And I can, we can basically extend that and say that, for example, I mean, back to, to your question, Marcin, or the, one of the points you, you mentioned about the, the opportunities for entrepreneurs, um, I think it's fair to say that the computer game sector is something that's been bo booming, uh, even in terms of listings. Is that right, Marek? Yeah, exactly. We are in terms of number of companies, we are number two in the world after Tokyo, and also the largest company on our venue is a gaming video company. It's the project, and uh, in this and uh, in this respect, uh, our uh, venue is not only a CE hub but it's also an entrepreneurial um, uh, hub. Um, for uh, tech ventures, especially in the video gaming. What comes back also to the tradition of Poland making movies through all the communist times and after the change, um, um, movie industry and production, post-production of movies was very strong and simply uh, similar artists uh, moved to the video gaming industry now. And even some companies which used to deal with the production of movies changed to the game developers. So there is a uh, there is a, there are enough artists for the gaming industry. There's enough uh, computer engineers. We have more STEAM alumni per year than all the Scandinavia countries combined. So, and only 15,000 less than Germany. So we have three uh, great brain trust for building up a uh, game, uh, gaming, uh, video gaming industry. Thank you, Marek. Marcin, anything you'd like to add from the perspective of, of new opportunities? Um, because of the crisis, as you touched on earlier. Well, I would probably, you know, add a comment so that we leave the audience also with the other side of the equation. We've spoken a lot about the opportunity. We've spoken a lot about the prospects, but we need to also be mindful of, you know, the risks and the weight and the weight on growth prospects. And I think why I'm why I'm blending that with opportunities because some of them actually can be, you know, should be converted into opportunities. Uh, so you know when, when you look at when you look at Poland longer term, there's the, the issue of demographics definitely remains, and that longer term will will you know be a, be a, be be some kind of a drag on, on growth. So you know anything around mitigating the demographical decline in working age population definitely is an area of you know potential upside going forward. Yeah, we need to be mindful of that. And I said it's. It's, it's, it's primarily a weight on the, on the growth prospect, but it also can, you know, we know the silver economy is expanding significantly globally. So, you know, Poland has, you know, relatively good fundamentals for that area to develop. Then, you know, the, 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 the composition of, 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 of industries in Poland, we do notice that there's a significant role of, you know, government related entities, uh, you know, including state link, linked banks. Which again, you know, from a growth perspective, can, will be you know, potentially can wait on growth, but also you know creates areas where potentially you know there is there is there is um, there is space for 
uh, for, for, for new entrants coming into the market and, and effectively tapping into that segment with you know, alternative solutions, whether you call it disruption, whether you call it you know, competitive pressure, however you look at it, yeah? Um, and then last but not least, remember that the Polish economy has historically been, been very dependent on EU structural funds. Uh, they will decline under the next EU multinational financial framework. So, so again, as I said, both a, both a weight on, on, on growth prospect, but also an opportunity to deploy more, more private capital into investments. Uh, that area has been very dominated by EU funds. So, so, so you know, the longer term opportunity is to create an equation that will allow more private funds to enter the space of whether it's public investments, whether it's innovation, whether it's anything related to long-term growth fundamentals, that, that, that's, that's an area that you know, I would underline as, as something that's worth considering. So I think you got yourself two, you know, an, an answer of two in one uh, for that question, which both give, gives an audience of the fact that it's, it's not an easy ride. I don't want anyone to leave this call thinking that it's going to be a, an, an easy ride. There are challenges for Poland, like for you know, all of the global economies. So we need to be mindful of both the prospects and the, and the risks. Um, but as I said, there are, you know, there are fundamentals that you know, if, 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 if things turn out well and if you know, the entrepreneurial spirit continues, there are pockets, pockets of, of, of opportunities that, that, that we hope will be, will, be, um, will be developed, will be deployed. Okay. Marcin, thank you for, for topping and tailing it. Um, my final question from the box in front of me is, does the exchange have uh, any trading, pro trading programs, liquidity trading programs to help some of the systematic quant uh, algo traders? I think I can answer that, uh, Marek. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, go so. ahead. Uh, you are in our sales team. So go ahead. We do have. <laughs> we do have. There Don't you go. Worry. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, look, we've gone over time, but I think it was worth taking that extra nine minutes. So uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you to the audience. I'm going to hand over uh, back to Arthur. Um, and uh, that's it from us. Arthur, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, so just falls for me to um, to wrap up uh, for today uh, for today's um, webinar. Um, thank you, everybody who's attended um, and participated, and thanks for your questions and engagement. Thank you to all the, the panelists and participant Sylvain for the very um, insightful presentation, and then the panel Peter, Marek, Ashwin, Marshit, Marchin, and Terence for your your thoughts and opinions. I thought that was a, a very engaging discussion. Um, any unanswered questions that have that have been sent in will be um, picked up and answered individually. So we have a record of those, and we'll we'll get back to the participants who we didn't get a chance to answer during the session. So thank you for those, um, uh, those, those contributions. And we'd be very grateful if you could just take a minute of time to um, fill in a survey on, the, um, uh, on the, the session today, which will be distributed to you. As you can see here, this is what it looks like. And it, it literally takes a few seconds to do. Your, your opinions are greatly valued by us and will help us to shape content and uh, webinars we run in the future to try and meet, um, uh, continue to meet the market's requirements as well. So thank you everyone for your time today. Wish you all a very good day uh, wherever you are and um, hopefully see you on a webinar at some point soon. Thanks and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.